Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Carl Pauls. I'm here with Gabe Ignetti, Chris Bergen, and today we're going to be talking about the Thorium Conference and Thorium Energy Alliance. Brand, I've been seeing them under Thorium Remix. Thorium Remix is one of them, but I also saw a couple of them under his channel, Gordon McDowell. You'll be able to check out a lot of those talks. So how did you like the conference? Pretty good. Well run, some good attendance. No more than $100 to, uh, to attend. And uh, also to see this new uh, molten salt research reactor that's it was just uh, about a mile and a half away from where the conference was, which was fun to tour. But uh, yeah, it was good. There's people moving ahead and we see light at the end of the tu tunnel. When you're talking about molten salt or thorium or using uranium and switching to thorium, like Thorcon has uh, has decided to do, before 2030 and possibly within the next two and a half years, we can see a uh, a working research reactor should be up in about two two and a half years and running. Welcome, John Kutch, to the show. Uh, well, I, I've been on here before, so assuming somebody. Saw it once. I'll just uh, briefly say the mission of Thorium Energy Alliance is to basically educate uh, decision makers and the public uh, about the many uses for thorium. It's obviously a component of uh, an advanced, safe nuclear fuel is uh, very prominent. But what we are very interested in these days is also reviving and creating new uses for uh nuclear uh, for thorium is beyond nuclear is to uh use it as a critical material uh you know so thorium was traditionally used in things like mag thor lumen thor thoria the highest temperature ceramic ever made thoriated glass near conducting superconducting cables and uh thoriated copper and of course very exciting to a lot of people and uh being heavily invested in by bill gates's thorium milking for thorium uh medicines uh, so you get actinium uh 213 i believe from from uh we spoke a little bit about that last time i was on yeah and uh so you could go to the thoriumenergyalliance.com website and we've got like a little thorium encyclopedia there, and it lists about a hundred different uses for thorium from the past. And I like to always say we have barely any knowledge of what thorium could be applied to. Well, it's the last and biggest stable atom, right? So it's fertile, it's not fizzle. And uh, so you can store it, you can handle it. It's an alpha emitter, not a beta or a gamma emitter. So it's, you know, it's easily managed. And it, it's a lot safer than a lot of industrial chemicals we use. You know, I wouldn't want to be around beryllium all that much and, you know, or ammonia. Uh, so, so um, you know, thorium is uh, pretty safe to handle and it makes things like the magnetron in your microwave and radar systems and, and super advanced imaging systems. And that's because, in short, it's because it's a giant atom and it has tons of electrons and it's very willing to give them up. So that's why it enhances things like conductivity, radar emission, things like that, that help it in that manner. And then, of course, the other thing is it's it fills up a lot of space between other molecules. From what I understand, you know, I'm sure there's some guy out there who's like, this guy's a moron. But it's crystal chemistry. It's crystal structure allows things like magnesium. So magthor and alumathor, you get very, very high strength very high temperature metal from metals that would normally be softer and mushier. So even though thorium is incredibly dense for just a three or 4% more thorium, you get super advanced alloys that we used to use in like Gemini spacecraft and phantom fighter jets and stuff like that. Anywho, that I said, I was going to be brief and I lied, but uh, there's, you know, <laughs> it's, but it's also it explains why we're so excited about this because there's, there's, the the fuel aspect of it is very exciting, but the materials aspect alone, and the the final cherry on top is you get thorium for free when you process rare earths into metals. So if we can get back into the metals, 
business in this country if we can get a metal refinery just one <laughs> you know if we could just get one metal refinery started in this country we would have all the thorium we wanted for free essentially you know and uh and we'd get all the rare earth critical materials you know because of that and right now we will never have domestic rare earth critical materials production until we you know solve the thorium uh issue so thanks for letting me say that i guess i'll see you later now (laughs) (laughs) great introduction good to see you mike hi well tell us you've been working on a number of books you spoke about one of them at the thorium thorium energy alliance conference uh the first is earth is a nuclear planet and that was a great presentation tell us about the next two that are coming Oh, yeah. In fact, I'm just wrapping up the uh, manuscript on the L&T report now. Um, it's called the L&T report. And it's a short book. It's about maybe it can be about 100 pages of text when it's done. And what it is, is it's a guided tour in plain language through Ed Calabrese's work on the linear no threshold history. It reads like a true crime story. And, you know, because he did all those. You may have seen some of the tapes that he did. He did video interview with the Health Physics Society. And I watched those five times and pieced together the timeline of the history because he jumped around in the interview, which is fine. So I pieced it together. So what I've, I've written is a plain language guided tour through the l and story and how we got here and how it came about, who did what, who lied about what, who bs the whole l and t thing it's the root mm-hmm. cause the bottleneck of nuclear power and, and so basically we have to kill l n t we have to kill l n t so that's that and then when I get that shipped off, I'm going back to finishing off roadmap to nowhere with Tim Maloney, which is an analysis and unpacking of mark jacobson's one hundred percent wind and solar grid. Mm-hmm. We read that four times, and when you look at his plan it's bs it's bad science it just doesn't let me put it this way it probably could work in theory but it's so ungodly unwieldy and expensive and sprawling quote this is a quote he assumes perfect transmission Mm -hmm. that's a three trillion dollar assumption because the NZA, the Net Zero America plan by Princeton, they ran a bunch of models and their 100% wind and solar grid has a transmission requirement that is spelled out and it all makes sense. So I trust their numbers far more than Jacobson's. But the NZA stuff, which I found far more comprehensive, was three and a half trillion for the transmission. And so when you break his plan down, he has 46,000 square miles of wind offshore. He has 22,000 square miles of solar farms, 3,000 square miles of rooftop solar, the existing pump storage, a trillion dollars in batteries, which he doesn't account for operations and maintenance. Batteries of that size need operations and maintenance. And we took NREL's numbers on that. And so that's another half trillion. And so that's another half trillion stuff wears out and you have to replace it and so basically it's a road test between his roadmap and a nuclear grid that we devise that does everything that he says his grid will do and it's about 25 to 50 percent less depending on the reactors used and if there were thorium reactors mr kutch the grid will cost half the price Thorcons, that we can put Thorcon barges or things of that ilk in hundreds and hundreds of ports all around the nation. Mm-hmm. You know, and is, I can yeah. uh, make a good point. Wind power generation fell last year by almost 3%. Well, why did it right. fall? Because there was a drought of wind. You know, the wind stopped blowing, essentially. We had almost 20% less wind last year. And yes, that can happen. That can go on for years. Yes, it can. And climate change, all these wind alleys that we talk about and tornado alleys, they might not exist. Thorium Energy Alliance does a lot of work trying to help El Salvador deploy the first advanced reactors in the world. And why would a country like El Salvador with 83% renewable energy, hydroelectric dams, geothermal, 
They don't have much wind, oddly enough, something about the way the wind blows down there, but they have a lot of solar. 83%, that's the wet dream of guys like Jacobs, right? 83%. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yet they want to go with nuclear. Why is that? Because that's all they could ever do. Like that was the max. They maxed out. There is no more energy to be had in a, in a country. Mm -hmm. they, they've used up all the land they're willing to use. They've used up all the rooftops. And it's phenomenally unreliable. Their dams had to be shut off last year because they ran out of water. Because if it was an El Nino year. So how did they replace that power? With giant diesel engines you know huge you know oh, engines God. bigger than train engines you know scores of them running day and night the most expensive possible energy huge yeah. amounts of yeah. diesel right and they have one combined cycle natural gas plant that's relatively new in the country but even that is run by the contractor isn't exactly giving them a break with the money let's say so that should be a wake-up call to anybody you know who wants to listen to jacobs that this is a country that achieved over 83% of the penetration of their grid. And their president and their scientists know if we want to triple the amount of power and remain carbon free and bring our people out of poverty, they're going to have to do it on the back of nuclear. And that's the only choice there is. If you've got very hot nuclear power, Jumping into the electric market, especially in the West, where it's been so bastardized and subsidized. So companies like Dow trying to put high temperature nuclear behind the meter to run their chemical plant. Companies like Exxon and Shell and uh, the tar sands folks up in Canada. You know, you could go on and on. The companies that are now starting to get into nuclear are going to put that power behind the meter. Even El Salvador has plans they want to do three gigawatts of new nuclear thermal and they want to dedicate about half of that to chemical production ammonia in particular and then a lot of water desalination because right. they need water oddly enough you know and then only about a gigawatt of that would be dedicated to electricity production and grid st stability and by doing that by the way they would stabilize eight countries in in uh, Central America and, and Mexico. They're part of a trunk line down there. And it would be hugely beneficial to all these people. And, you know, the knock-on effects of all this, Mike, and uh, Echo Modernists are, if you're not super excited about people bum-rushing the southern border of the United States and just breaking down the doors, well, one way to keep them at home is to give them jobs and opportunity and energy and yeah, water. Exactly. And so you exactly. should be super supportive of the idea that, hey, if there's if if El Salvador now has an ammonia industry and a Bitcoin mining industry and plastics industry, and they, they can increase their, their production of clothing, which is a big industry down there, things like mm -hmm. that. Now you now exactly. you're employing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And they'd rather stay home. Uh, Chris, yeah. why don't you slip in there? Uh, question for John. Uh, John, I know you're keeping really busy as an ambassador for thorium and energy independence. I believe you recently went to a, like a steel makers convention. Uh, was there anything yeah. interesting uh, coming out of that? Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's all, you know, so this is the fifth year that I've gone to uh, the Association for Iron and Steel Technology, but it's probably the biggest iron and steel conference, certainly in the United States, if not the world. There was over 8,000 attendees, 700 exhibitors, and uh, it's the biggest it's ever been. So it's interesting that such a pretty ancient technology is still being worked on. And we attend fossil conferences and mining conferences and water we attend anything but nuclear conferences, basically, because it's like we don't those things are basically echo chambers. Right. You go there and you say, and it's like, you know, it's like, hey, there's Carl and Chris and Mike. And then you go to another one. And you're like, hey, there's Mike and Chris and Carl. And it's just like the same, you know, 50 people. And it's like it's an echo chamber. And there's not a big this is this was from my the start in this about 20 years ago. I would harangue. American Nuclear Society and NEI and and uh, you know these other nuclear groups, but guess what? They're they're run by companies like uh, ComEd that have coal generation, 
and solar generation and all their children are beautiful beautiful babies and they never want to say now these are ugly babies nuclear is the pretty baby we finally have constellation in the united states edf in france was really good about this but constellation is really stepping up because they're a nuclear only company and so now we finally have a nuclear only operator that's willing to you know say the other uh, emperors have no clothes and that they're ugly and they're wart covered and they're gross and uh you know and that yeah. and that you know solar and wind have to stop pretending to be anything other than the blackest of black energies you know right in there with coal if you ask me when you go to these conferences it's really important because there's we hear it in our heads all the time but when you go and tell a bunch of rough tough iron dudes they understand you can make iron with hydrogen but they don't have they're like well hydrogen's you know eight dollars a kilogram and we're like no it could be 50 cents a kilogram if you make it with nuclear and they're like oh wow you know then it would be cheaper and better than the the iron we have today it's like well how about that same thing with synthetic liquid fuels or even just providing process heat to refineries because People don't understand almost 40% of all the oil in a barrel of oil is burned to make the rest of the barrel oil into oil products. So they're burning the furniture. What if instead of burning the oil to make oil, you could have nuclear power and you'd ha instantly have 30% more oil to put on the market? You know, it's, right. it seems, in, and they've known about this. They knew about it back in the 50s. They don't care. They make a shit ton of money as it is. And, you know, they don't pay a price for it. And they, you know, they nationalize the pollution. They're fabulously smart people in the oil business and petroleum business, but they're not economic. They're chemical engineering geniuses, but they know instantaneously when you tell them, hey, you know, even if you spent $10 billion on a reactor and you put it in Whiting, Indiana and ran the Whiting refinery, they'd make that back in six months. So it's not a price thing. You know, they're, I always like to say, you know, they're building a $36 billion ethylene facility in Louisiana. And that's $36 billion. That's a lot so, of money. So what if they put a $6 billion, you know, make it rounded up to 40 and put a $4 billion nuclear reactor there. And think of how fast they'd pay off that facility if they didn't have energy to worry about, you know, so... So that's, and then they also that's why I attend all these different organizations. That message that there's process heat for a penny a kilowatt, there's electricity for two cents a kilowatt, that's out there. It's available. This is not magic stuff. This is this is what we could. And I never stress this because these are industry dudes and accountants, but you do get the benefit of greatly reducing the carbon footprint. But this is national security. This is makes you money. You know, what else is there? Money and security. Who cares about the environment? I mean, I do, but like they don't. Yeah. Why bring it up? Yeah. I had a, I had a question for each of you guys to Mike. I was talking with Carl before the show and I was mentioning that I had recently looked up that the International Energy Administration uh, now uh, has said that buffered solar, you know, even with the batteries and storage is is the cheapest energy source. So is the improvements in solar panels is set you know, in your robot? We actually you know? go into that. They're talking about the efficiency of converting light to electricity. You know, that might go up to like 30%, but your average capacity is, it's going to change incrementally, like maybe 1% or something like that. And so they are really blowing a lot of smoke up their butt, playing with these numbers. I mean, the panel is still sitting in the sun where it's sitting in the sun. And you might raise your efficiency of electrical conversion from like 22 to 30%. But that doesn't translate into seven points higher average capacity. I think Gabe's <laughs> hitting at the economic case. And economic if I'm gonna case. yeah, if I'm gonna yeah. take a stab at that, you're missing out on decarbonization when your core topic is always, okay, where's my next dollar coming from? Where's my next dollar? Where's my next dollar? And then you hit the wall at some percentage of renewables because you, you don't actually have two weeks of storage. You don't actually have yeah. all of the country's hydroelectric at your command. Batteries they're talking about give you two to four hours worth of juice. So you got to have a lot of batteries to back up a capacity factor of 20%. Yeah. I hate that when people are like, oh, solar will last for 20, 25 years. 
solar starts to degrade the second you put it in. People don't like to talk about that. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. if you're 20% efficient conversion in year one, by year 20, you're down to about 15%, maybe 10%. And that's yeah. after all the hailstorms and dust and billions of gallons of deionized water you have to- And all the dead turtles. Yeah, I always like to say solar and wind needs nuclear. Nuclear doesn't need solar and wind. I'm thinking about Jacobson's grid in the ocean, and the stuff that he's going to put out there will require, I think it's 12 or 20 full rebuilds every day. Yeah, well, you know, they get the best capacity factors, but with all the crap you got to do to lay the cables and then service it, and you're servicing it with- fossil powered boats and they're huge boats they're ships they're not boats and can you imagine that the nation would be obligated to do 12 full refurbishments or replacements of wind turbine generators at sea every day yeah i, I think it's a desecration to the ocean it's just, yes, it is. Well, not only that, but the, but, the, but the panels, we did this cool thing. We added up his panels and we added up at what he figured the longevity would be, which is 30 years. But anyway, we used his numbers and he would have a pile of used panels the size of the Empire State Building every month. And that's wow. if you stack them tight. That's the volume of waste. And you either have to recycle that stuff or make new stuff. It's way too expensive to recycle. Well, there you go. It's 25 bucks to recycle a panel and two bucks to throw it in the landfill. So where's it going to end up? Or it'll end up overseas, like all our used clothing and our used electronics, and it's the same thing. But, I mean, that's something that any normal person can wrap their mind around. The amount of solar he's predicting at his longevity prediction of 30 years you need a daily replacement rate of 585,000 panels. And at the end of the month, that stack of panels tight, no gaps between the panels, the volume of the Empire State Building every month. Yeah. And so yeah. what we did is we just took his plan and blew it up to what it should be and go, this is what he's asking for. And he's not quite coming out and telling you. Let me get the question to John here. I had one of the first VCRs. It was gigantic. It cost me $1,000 way back when, right? I got mine for 900 <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the point I'm trying to make is this. You know, I'm looking at what's going on with the MSRs and Thorium, and I know they're just taking off. But, like, I really got to wonder if it's wiser just to go right to Thorium and the MSR, at least, at very least the MSR, and just go great guns on that rather than say we're going to continue with these small modular reactors or even the the ap 1000s because they might very be well antiquated uh, in maybe Why? too short a time and there's too much upfront money i mean what do you Why think would about they be that? antiquated if you have the fuel for well no, i'm talking about compared to msr oh well, well yeah. if you're gonna, I, mean, saying, I mean if you can i mean the the new build it would be great to do something like Copenhagen Atomics. I, I always try and I just right now a little sidebar. The thorium is a fuel and it needs a neutron source. So we're always going to need some uh, uranium or something. You need something or, spicy or, you know, to get the party started. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so it's like, uh, so thorium's a fuel. I mean, and the, the reactor form is, you know, we're a little theoretically agnostic, although I'm obviously a big supporter of, molten salt because of its low pressure, super high performance and uh, safety, you know, profile and all that. But uh, as Mike was hinting at, you know, we were continuously rebuilding these existing light water reactor and boiling water fleet. And while they, at some point, they do have a terminal point in their existence, it's been pretty well proven we can get 60, 80, maybe 100 years out of these machines and solar cells <laughs> you know trying to get big big industrial things approved today in the western world has become phenomenally difficult thing so it's like if you've got this merchant class machine making one two four gigawatts of electricity you know you ought to keep it around as long as you possibly can oh obviously yeah. and and uh, sort of like you know the old mantra right reduce reuse recycle you know, you know, like, you know, we should use what we have currently. And what I do like 
is that you're starting to see companies like Energy uh, Solutions, Holtec, you know, they're talking about while they run these new machines or these older machines for another 20, 40 years, they want to build, you know, equally large deployment of advanced molten salt reactors, inherently safe reactor of some sort. Holtec has their own Holtec 160, which is just a small light water reactor, to be honest with you. But so I do like the reuse of the footprint because you know, these nuclear plants had these ridiculous setbacks, you know, 500 to well over a thousand acres for one of these sites. And the actual production part is, you know, 20, 30 acres of that. And so, so they got plenty of room, you know, theoretically. So, I mean, I have great hope that your saying comes true that sooner than later, unfortunately, probably not in the West, I'll be honest with you, you know, China is going to deploy molten salt reactors pretty soon. Uh, Indonesia or El Salvador will probably be the first place in the world for in the in the so-called Western world to deploy, you know, molten salt reactors. Uh, God, even maybe Finland or somewhere like that might deploy. You know, getting Germany back uh france might deploy pretty quickly you know if we're, if we're lucky but look at the united arab emirates is the poster child for this they built mm -hmm. four uh c a c1000 you know korean it's apr with four, apr 1400s yeah two so they did it in about 10 years on time on budget you know so there's proof that they can be done and they started from scratch they had to build roads they had to build mm -hmm. a university. They had to build a regulatory agency. They had to do it all. So now the, the there's a RFP out there for four more, and they don't even know what to do with the first four. For much of the year, they have one that they're not sure what they're going to do with, but they do have a very good idea what they're going to do with it now. What they're going to do is they're going to start doing things like make ammonia and synthetic fuels and uh, hydrogen to uprate petroleum. So. Are we going to cede our lead in this technology to UAE and Indonesia? It's like they're wonderful countries, but I, I would like to think that we could get back in the game. The takeaway is keep these big old merchant class babies running, maybe even build a couple more. They're not bad. And, uh, but, well, yeah, and, there's build, and then the build and advance smaller dudes also as fast as we possibly can. Well, the nice thing about the small modular reactors is every single part is replaceable, including the pressure vessel. And so literally the reactor could literally last forever. You know, yeah. you just, you just and, and, and yeah, they're fueled by uranium. And as I pointed out in my TX speech, with seawater uranium, you have no import hassles. You have no market shenanigans. You have no scarcity geopolitical. Well, we have to be nice to Kazakhstan because that's where we get your, our uranium. You know, they, you know, we don't need yeah. to do anything of that crap and even if it costs more money to do the seawater uranium what's getting rid of all that other stuff worth this is why that uh repowering coal has been interesting to me for 20 years i mean it's becoming the pretty girl in the room microsoft is into it and stuff but like because what's the biggest bottleneck to new nuclear it's actually not the nuclear you know regulator getting a license to you it's how do you get the transmission lines out right so it's like if you can use an existing coal place that already has a has a, a punch down from the grid and a, and a switch yard, that's a huge opportunity. You know, that's a huge win. And, and eighty uh, percent of our coal plants, going to the DOE, are good candidates for this. Yeah, so for the, sure. The potential is enormous. You got a workforce. You got water. You got the substation. I mean, you got rail, presumably, to get the coal there. But now you could use yeah. I mean, and, and presumably they built them because there's a town nearby. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's it's hugely, you know, but, you know, the idea that this is this new idea from, you know, the, the, these these guys are like, oh, we've got this new idea. I'm like, man, they've been talking about repowering coal plants for, you know, 25 years. And, uh, but at least probably 75 years, to be honest with you. But the, uh, I, I think there's huge opportunity, but that's that's the bottleneck. If you tried to build a new anything, you know, even a solar facility to try and get a new to try and get a new substation and a transmission line, if you're crossing anybody's property, and of course you're crossing people's property, it's just it's become bananas. You know, it's become yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. untenable. Well, and, that's one thing. Then, yeah, I don't uh, need to tell anybody on this broadcast, but 
you're gonna you're gonna try and power 30 60 100 million electric vehicles the electrification is it's completely untenable to electrify what people think they're going to electrify just from the standpoint of we don't even have the ability to make transmission cables in this country anymore right you know and our buddies in korea make them are not so good buddies in china make them but like we don't we're not a cable making nation anymore so just simple things like that need to be reinvented and then i, I don't know about you guys but i've got a hybrid plug-in hybrid but man you know 70 million more of those plug-in hybrids and the the grid would be in brownout mode <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, and then these bring... guys are like we're going to use electric cars as our battery backup i'm like no you're not not even for oh yeah right yeah yeah the the yeah the national tesla battery that's one thing we bring up a roadmap to nowhere is if you repower coal plants, you already have, it's already zoned for power. It has a built-in transmission system and all the other stuff John was talking about. Whereas if Jacobson wants to build out his grid, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of the facilities he wants to plant are greenfield spaces that need transmission. And he's fatuously presuming that the transmission will be perfect. Well, is it going to be perfect running out to like, you know, goat snot Montana to a wind farm that was never there before? No. Is going to have to run through, you know, um, Dutton's farm and a ranch. And he won't be happy, you know. Is, is, in is fact, there such it, a? I, well, go ahead. Yeah, is there such a place as Great Snot, Montana? <laughs> go, go to Snot, Montana, man! I'm telling you. you know, okay. It's a, a great <laughs> little town. There. Yeah, but 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 anyway, the point being is that Jacobs's thing is so fabulous that he fatuously presumes. That, oh, well, we'll just like build a bunch of wind and solar farms. Well, how are you going to get the zoning? How are you going to get the transmission? You know, how are you going to get the roads? You know, and so the vast majority of what he proposes will be greenfield space. And they're running into obstacles already. Can you imagine ramping it up? But nuclear can fit in existing plants. You know, take out bad heat, put in good heat. You know. So those are these are the things that we bring up in the book. And it, all in all, it's like, it's amazing how you have thousands of people with great degrees, crunching numbers, and being mulishly oblivious to, you know, normal stuff like how you didn't get the permit. Thanks, everyone, so much for your contributions. Uh, this, this episode of the Eco Modernist Channel Live. Remember, we are live every or nearly every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, right here on YouTube at the Eco Modernist channel. You can also find us on my personal Twitter, Carl Alex Pauls. You can find us on Twitch at soyattle.tv or twitch.tv slash soyattle. You can find us on Facebook at the Eco Modernist Society of North America, and you can find us on our website at esna.earth. If you'd like to help us continue to make programs like this, you can donate to us at patreon.com Eco Modernist Channel. That's Eco Modernist Channel at patreon.com. Thank you everyone so much for your contributions, and remember, emissions first, peace and justice will follow. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, Ecomodern Channel. Also to subscribe to us on Twitter and Facebook, Ecomodern Society of North America. And online at https.esna.earth.